All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Rider. This has been a hot minute since we've done this. I'm going back to my roots and going back to the recorded version of the Beyond the Rider series. I'm hoping to continue to be doing this weekly on my YouTube channel as well as all podcast platforms. So we are very honored to have Mr. Ted of the Motorcycle Men podcast with us. Uh, Ted, how are you doing, sir? Dandy, man. Thanks for having me on the show. I greatly appreciate oh, it. Man. I really do. Great to have you here. So yeah. what's uh, what's new? It seems like it's been a hot minute since we talked. <laughs> uh, it's been what? Two, a week? <laughs> two, 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 two weeks or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> so if you guys don't know, I've had the pleasure of sitting in on the Motorcycle Men podcast just two weeks ago. And then TJ yeah, was, was a horrible me. guest on the show. It was, I was. I was. I can't oh, we talk about YouTube stuff. and Yeah, yeah YouTube. <laughs> Who watches YouTube nowadays? <laughs> yeah. It's cool. Yeah. So why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us the, the who, what, when, where, why. Hey, God. Uh, my name's Ted, and I am the host of the Motorcycle Men podcast and uh, the Ride with Ted YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, please subscribe. Like, uh, comment, and subscribe. Yeah. Um, see, the podcast has been is, is in its eighth year now. We're coming up on wow. being nine years in March. Uh, I just did our 363rd episode. Wow. And uh, we are uh, the fourth longest running motor uh, motorcycle related podcast. Uh, aside from that, geez, oh my God, I got my motorcycle endorsement back in 1987 when you're a ki real young kid, remember? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was, I, I was riding before then. I had, a, I had a couple, I had one bike prior to that. Oh, uh, and uh, I had mentioned earlier before we even started, I went dirt biking. Uh, don't know what kind of bike it was. I was only like 12 years old. I knew, I knew, can I say bad words? You can say whatever you want, man. I, I knew jack shit about motorcycles, you know, I, except I knew that I wanted a Harley. That's the only thing I knew. What's well, uh, more Americana? Yeah. And you know, my dad, my mom and dad were divorced. So my dad, it was his turn to pick it, to have us for the weekend. And my dad picked us up on a, on a Friday night. And he said, I said, what are you doing this week? Goes, well, we're going to, I'm going to take you up to a friend's house up in uh, Groton on Hudson in New York. And uh, we're going to go visit. I said, okay, fine. That's, that's great. So me and my brother, you know, we we're go up there. And the guy says, is my, my dad's friend says, uh, we got to, um, we got some dirt bikes and we're going to take the guys out to the quarry. And if you guys want to ride, there's usually hundreds of people. Yes, that ride. Yes, yes. Well, and, and me and my, me and my brother just looked at each other like, okay, sure. You know? And, um, next thing I know, here I am now, mind you, uh, I am in my Sunday best. Okay. And, uh, I've never ridden a motorcycle before. So Seems they gave fair. me this, uh, they gave me and my brother, uh, uh, size appropriate motorcycles you know dirt bikes. i don't know what they were i remember mine was yellow that's all i know so and this is like or this is uh oh my god 19 i'm dating myself boys and girls this uh -oh. is 1971 okay 1970 1971 something like that uh no yeah 1970 it's about 1970 like that right around there anyway so um he, he they Put this, they handed me a helmet, which was like three sizes too big. And they showed me how to, how to start it and how to change gears. And they said, off you go. And it's like dirt and there's mounds and there's motorcycles, just dirt bikes go everywhere, just everywhere. Just, it was just pandemonium and okay, fine. And I, I didn't know this, but you know, if, at the time, if you leaned over too far, the bike would stall. Because that was a feature apparently built into the bike. I remember you telling the story, yeah. And I was having a mediocre time because I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but uh, it was fun. Yeah, that was my first experience with motorcycles, actually. Yeah, we, on a motorcycle. But what? Uh, yeah. So, so they taught you out safely, you know, let you take baby steps. And yeah, I don't know. There was no <laughs> talk of safety at all. My, uh, that's how I, I think that's the first, yeah. The first time I rode a motorcycle, my buddy was like, oh, you, did you ever ride a stick? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Here's the clutch. You'll be fine. Yeah. yeah see, see now, and that was pretty much motorcycle safety training in the 70s, 60s and 70s. It was yeah. pretty much, here's a helmet. Here's a motorcycle. Don't kill yourself. And that was it. So. Learn all the bad habits from your friend, and then wow. you can continue them for generations. And yeah, absolutely. And you know, then I when I, I joined the Navy uh, in seventy seven, 
I, I enlisted and I ended up down in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. That, that was my first duty station. Did you order the code red? No, no, no. You know what it is? Uh, see, this is back when back when Guantanamo was an actual functioning military installation, you know, and, you know, it had an airfield and a whole nine yards, you know, carriers and destroyers and would all pull in. It was it really was, OK. I didn't realize it was that big. It was a huge functioning base, you know, and this was at the height of the Cold War, of course. So and I was in the fire department. And it was it was pretty fun. I had I had a blast. And then one day, uh, one of the guys I was in, um, uh, I was in the barracks. One of my barracks mates, you know, he's had he had a Suzuki Suzuki. Yeah, it was a Suzuki TC one twenty five, and then it it was red. So <laughs> everything's better when it's red. Everything is better when it's red. It's faster when it's red, and it's just cooler when it's red. <laughs> So, um, you know, we we're somehow the conversation came up with motorcycles and he goes, I'm selling mine. No, really? What do you got? He goes, and he told me, I'm like, I have no idea. So he goes, uh, 400 bucks. I'm like, I'm in. Yeah, really? You're $400. You want to sell, sell. So, um, next, I said, anyway, next paycheck, I'll, I'll give you the money. So I gave him the money and so he signed it over to me and boom, so boom, I got, and now I own a motorcycle and I didn't have a license. I didn't have an endorsement, but I knew that I could get one on the base. Okay. So, I had to, uh, I would have to go over to the other side of the base, take the, take the written test. And then the week later I would have to take the, you know, the driving test. So, um, neither of those happened, <laughs> <laughs> but I did, um, I did ride the bike around the barracks area, uh, without a helmet. Cause I did not own one. And I was just like, to, I would just tool around and, uh, I nearly killed myself several times. You know, uh, had, it, it had a bad clutch. <laughs> it, had, it had a bad carburetor. It, and it, it did things on its own. Uh, I could be sitting still and the clutch would engage. So I don't know if that was cabling or whatever, but <laughs> I have no idea. I just remember one day the carburetor was like, the, the bike was like, so i'm reaching down under there between my legs and i'm messing with the carburetor you know just making adjustments next thing i know i'm, I'm of course i'm throttling it and um <laughs> next thing i know the bike is taking off and i'm still holding on to the bars <laughs> and um i managed to get get control of it and get on it and um immediately lost control and ended up in a bush so some shrubbery I, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, so I think it was a matter of hours and I said, you know what? I'm going to get rid of it. So I sold it for a loss. So that's okay. okay. But you had some fun with it. I mean, if you had 400 hours worth of fun, I, mean, you know, I, I got educated on what not to do. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I eventually, um, let me see. I, I you know, it was funny because like an 85, after I got out of service, um, I, you know, like I, said, I always wanted a Harley. And at the time in 85, you could pick up a brand new Sportster for thirty five hundred bucks, spanking new right off the showroom floor. Damn! Of course, you had to find a showroom because there were no. Oh, yeah. And if you well, there was I think there was one in New Jersey, and and, and if you which had it back then, you had to order it. There was no there was no bikes to buy. You had to order the bike. Oh. And back then, you you had to wait. Anywhere up to two years before your bike was ready. Holy smokes. Yeah. I know that's like in yeah. the early 2000s when that was going on too. No, cool. Yeah. Well, in the early 2000s. Well, I, I know in 90, in the early 90s, that was still the case. Oh, it was um, 90s. Yeah. Early 90s. Well, I never did get a bike, uh, but in 87, uh, a guy I worked with, he says, I'll help you get your license. I'll teach you how to ride. And, you know, and so he did. You know, he taught me. He had, he had a, um, an early, very early Goldwing. Ooh. I don't know what year it was, but he, he, he taught hey, me. Let's say. He taught me. Yeah. I mean, he taught me on, he taught me how to, you know, the ride and shift and all that stuff like that. And it was, there was this, um, big apartment complex where I lived and I was able to ride around the, the complex, just, you know, learning how to ride the bike. It was great. So, uh, then I went down and I, you know, I took the written test. Of course, I aced it. And then I took, um, then he took me down for the, uh, for the test. 
he 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 rode the bike down. I drove uh, my car down. Okay, and then you know I did the test on the bike. Piece of cake passed. Got my endorsement, and now I was just okay. Now I just gotta get a bike. You know. Um, so you took the so you took the endorsement test on a Goldwing. I did. Nice oh, on an early. I, I again it, we're, we're talking. I would have to uh, if I had to guess. Eighty. His his Goldwing was eighty five, maybe. 85? Okay. Four, I guess. I remember it was black. That's all I do remember. But uh, yeah, it was. I it was manageable. It wasn't it wasn't uh, well, crazily huge. My my heritage was much bigger. You know. Okay. Oh, uh, that's right, because it was the older gold wings before they. Yeah, were it was like one of the older ones. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, yeah, no, man, that was uh, wow, way back then, man. I was I was broke all the time. This guy had no. I was working two jobs. And I was broke all the time. So. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know where my, you know, I think about it now. I was like, where the hell is my money going? I have no idea. So, um, so there was no getting a motorcycle for me right away, but, um, fortunately what happened was, you know, you know, time, you know, you, the years go by and you work more and you advance and, you know, life gets to get a little better for you. And, um, I was working for a interior design firm in, uh, North Jersey. And, uh, the, the gentleman that I worked for, it was a small company. It was basically, it was basically just four of us. Okay. It was the boss, his wife, uh, the, the wife's sister and me, that was the company. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, he, he made, he made huge money, man. There was a lot of coin coming into that office, but he, uh, in, in, uh, in 93 or late 92, he went to, uh, one of the, the local dealer in Jersey at the time in Edison and he ordered a Sportster or Sportster 883. Okay. A year and a half later, they told him it was ready. He can come pick it up. You know, they told him it was being delivered. I was like, okay, cool. It was cool. So he brought it. I was like, right, it was great. It was cool. This was nice. So it was a 1994 model that he got. And um, yeah, he had some extra things put on it. You know, he had bags put on it, windshield, an extra tack. Yeah, because he had the speedometer and a tachometer next to it. And that was pretty much it. He didn't have it chromed out and everything like that. The funny thing it was about it was he was such a workaholic that he never wrote it, never wrote the thing. And I would, every time I, you know, and, and every time I saw him, I said, hey, did you take the bike out this weekend? No, I didn't take the bike out. <laughs> and, you know, he went, like this went on for years. I mean, when I, I mean, literally it went on for years. So, uh, it then it came to the point where I was, I, I left his company, but I continued to work part-time for him. And, uh, I would, every time I so would come in to would do some work and I say, Hey, so, so you've ridden a bike lately? No, nah, the tires are flat. Batteries. Dead. <laughs> but he I, has, I have to get some cables changed because there's the tires are cracking. And I was like, Oh, well. it's like, dude, I said, listen, if, if you want a, a good home for the bike, I'll gladly take care of it for you. You know, so that was a running joke for a few years. And then um, one day I'm at the office and I, I get in there and he comes over to me and he goes, okay, let me, let me ask you this. How many hours would you work for me for free? And I give you the sports star. Two. Well, I said, seriously? <laughs> he goes, yeah. He says, I, it's, uh, I, I, he, he had a, uh, he had a penthouse down in uh, Delray beach, Florida. Very nice. And, uh, he, he thought he'd bring, bring it down there and he would ride it more because they were going down there, you know, twice a month and it didn't, it just sat in his garage. <laughs> it just, you know, the tires would go flat or whatever. So I, I said, well, uh, here's my pay rate. So how many hours are, you know, how much you offer the bike? We figured the cost out. I said, okay, so it'll be like 18 months working for you for nothing. He goes, okay, fine. Sold. So, uh, he, um, he, okay. he brought, the next day he brought in, uh, the, uh, the title, he signed it over to me for them, for the amount of money. And this is all you got to do now is you got to just come down to Delray beach and get it. So I knew I was doing it. Yeah. It wasn't too bad, you know, cause I had a pickup truck and I said, okay, let me, look, I I'm going on, I'm, I'm doing a, a mountain bike festival next week, the end of next week, I'll leave the beginning of the week. I'll come down to you, pick up the bike, drive back, and then, you know, I'll drop the bike off at the Harley dealer and say, look at this thing and check it out. And then I'll go to the mountain bike festival, which is exactly what I did. I drove down, got the bike and drove back. And um, 
that was my first bike. I dropped it off at the Harley dealer and they fixed everything that was wrong. You know, and there was, there was quite a few, there was a laundry list of things that needed to be replaced. Some hoses for, you know, fuel hoses and things like that, you know, Sitting there, yeah. cables that were all dry rotted and things like that. So replaced a lot of stuff, um, brakes, bearings, etc. And tires, of course. So, um, yeah. And then I just started, uh, riding the bike, you know, it's like, I, I would, I would take this sports to route, man. I was, I would like, because again, this is my, my bike now and I haven't ridden since I got my license. And that's how long has passed at that point? Uh, like 15, 20 years. No, 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 no. Uh, um, eight years. Okay. I was thinking it was longer than that. Okay. No, it's yeah, a so long time though. It's still eight years, man. Yeah. So I, uh, I would start at my house and I would like ride around the block and then I would, and each time I took the bike, I would, I would expand it and go out further and further and further. And eventually what I ended up doing was, um, I think it was like maybe about that was in the spring that summer, even though I had my endorsement already, I took a, a um, MSF course. Good move. Good move. Yeah. So I took it. I was, I was at Lakehurst actually. Is at the Lakehurst Naval Air Station. That's where they had the class. So I took it, and the guy's like, "I mean, because you already got your license and a bike." So it's like, "Yeah, I'm look, I'm doing this as a refresher. I've been off the bike for a while." Okay, so no problem passing the course. It was a piece of cake. But now I felt more confident now that I've taken this class mm -hmm. and more. And then I just started getting out there. <laughs> you know, um, I didn't venture out of Jersey or anything like that, but. I had that bike for uh, 10, just a little over 10 years. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I got the bike. You ready for this? I got the bike with 1,600 miles on it. Okay. Now, mind you, I got it when it was 10 years old. <laughs> 1,600 miles was on that bike in 10 years. So I, if I put on an additional 15,000 miles on that thing in 10 years. Wow. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, uh, you know, browsing Cycle Trader, as you do. And I saw this heritage, and it was gorgeous. And I said, I'm going to go take a look at this thing. So I, I rode out to, is that um, uh, uh, Brian's? Was that Brian's, Harley Davidson? Is that okay. Right? okay. That's the that? I use, yeah, right in Langhorn. Yep, and that's right there in Langhorn. That's where I went. And I looked at it. I saw the bike. I was like, oh, man, this thing is awesome. I took it for a test ride. That was great. And I was on the phone with my wife. I said, man, this bike is beautiful. So what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to get it. If, you know, okay, well. So we finagled some things. And <laughs> well, next thing you know, I'm putting a deposit down on the bike. You know, and he goes, okay, fine. So the guys kept going, when are you going to come get it? When are you going to get it? When are you going to get it? Well, it is Saturday at, you know, 5 o'clock. There's not a lot going to happen now. So I'll be back, you know, next week, next weekend to come get it. So that's what I did next weekend. It's funny is that I told my brothers that I went to this Harley dealer in Pennsylvania and they have a lot of bikes there because at the time, oh, no peer pressure, <laughs> they didn't have their licenses. These guys, they didn't have their endorsements for that, for bikes, but they, they, they were on the verge. Tim had a scooter, I believe. <laughs> oh, those guys that start with scooters, man. Did he, did he have a scooter at the time? Yes, he, he did. did. Yeah. He had a scooter at the time. Chris didn't have his endorsement. They were working on it. In fact, so, but anyway, so I said, you want to go, go with me to these, this dealership and we'll go look at these bikes. They have, they have a crap load of motorcycles. Oh, okay, fine. So they just thought we were going there just to look at motorcycles. So I told the, the salesman, so I told that, I said, look, do me a favor. When we're going around, don't say anything that I bought the bike. He says, well, we've taken it off the floor and it's in the shop getting cleaned up. I said, well, just leave it there and it's show me around so we'll, we'll he showed us around the store and he's you know in the back and all that stuff like that and, and they were going my brothers were oohing and on and all the bikes that they were seeing stuff. and then uh he goes i have another bike in mike's in here i want to show you so he brought us into the shop where all the other bikes were including the one that i just bought and it had a sold sign on it <laughs> and my brother said, oh dude look at you missed out on this and i'm like no and i pulled the thing off i said it's mine <laughs> Oh, uh, so they're, so they're, you know, they're calling me names all day from that, that point on. And that was in, that was in December too. And I had to ride the bike home and I didn't have any, well, what I, I did have winter gear. 
I did. I actually, I brought, I, I brought my space suit with me and I rode the, uh, with the space suit all the way home. So I felt good. Oh yeah, it was, it was all right. It was fine. But that was that. And, uh, that's the bike I've had ever since, you know, since uh, I bought it in 2014, it's a 2003, uh, Harley Davidson hundredth anniversary heritage classic. Nice. That's a and beautiful bike. It is a pretty bike. I mean, it really is pretty, you know, it's it, what sold me on it was the big spoke wheels. That's what's, that's mm -hmm. what's me on it, you know? And I, I bought it in, like I said, in 2014 and that's the bike that I ride pretty much just about everywhere. Uh, and then last year, this is 2021. Yeah. February of last year, I picked up a 2003 100th anniversary Sportster. Nice. Yeah. So that's like, uh, I, I, I wanted to get back on a Sportster again because sadly when I got the heritage, uh, a month and a half later, two months later, I sold the 883 that I had. Okay. And to this day I'm kicking myself that I sold it. Cause I wish I didn't. It's always but, the way. Uh, yeah. But you know what? Uh, I, I the heritage has been a wonderful bike. I've had I've had issues with it, but you know, uh, as you would, you know, because it had the twin cam. It's got the twin cam in it, and the twin cam eighty eight. Uh, for those who don't know, had a issue with the cam chain tensioners back in the day. So, okay. You know, and I, I guess you because you listen to the podcast, you've you've heard yeah. the story a gazillion times probably. Um, but uh, I, <laughs> after a year of the bike being down because of the cam chain tensioners i eventually rebuilt it and got the bike back on the road and that's that's the i, I rode that i've been all over the place with that bike florida that's awesome keys, florida keys twice sturgis you were Sturgis this year yeah yeah so it's been great a lot of fun yeah a lot, lot more trips coming up too that's awesome so you you mentioned your brother so yeah. that's a good that's a good segue to that so you uh you guys have quite the collaborations so you were in a band together right yeah you know we we, we just we just don't learn you know? <laughs> <laughs> no um misery loves company yeah you know back in the uh in the uh late 80s um my brothers and i uh we started a band um it was a, it was a hard rock heavy metal band called thunderheart and it was uh, me on guitar, my brother Tim on guitar, and Chris was on drums. And we got we brought in a bass player and a lead singer, and we did all the original. We we played all originals. We played in all the all the shit clubs in New Jersey that you can imagine. Yeah, we, plenty of them. What's that? <laughs> There's plenty of them. <laughs> There's plenty of them. You know, we didn't we didn't make a dime off of any gig we ever did, because um, that's just the way the business is. It's just yeah. the way the is. you you play for nothing. You know, you play for exposure. You know, so. You're going to be big kid. I tell you, you're gonna be big. you know, we had a lot of people that were on our side and, you know, we played some relatively high profile places and it all went to crap when we found that our bass player was, you know, doing heroin gigs and, you know, stuff like that. So it kind of <laughs> fell apart from that point. And the lead singer, or not the lead singer, okay, it was, uh, oh, yeah, the 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 um, Chris he 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 bowed out of it because he got tired of the shit, and so it all just kind of fell apart at that, <laughs> that point. Yeah, you know, so and then uh, I had a couple other bands after that, and I took some time off. And then in 1999, yeah, around 99, we um, I threw it out there. I said, hey, why don't we just do a tribute band? You know, let's get together, let's do a tribute band of some sort, and. They said, yeah, why don't we do something like that? That seems painless. <laughs> sure. Famous last words. That's yeah, painless. It's no big deal. So now listen, because we'd always have like family barbecues and stuff like that. And naturally the guitars would come out and the drums mm -hmm. would come out, and then we'd be playing. And we did a lot of melon camp, you know, John Cougar melon mm -hmm. camp, a lot of that stuff. And you know, they said, you know, well, you know, you kind of sound like the guy. So well, why don't we do it that way? So we decided that we we're going to do a John Mellencamp tribute band. And uh, where my brother Tim lived at the time, his neighbor played keyboards. So we asked him if he might be interested. He said, yes. And uh, uh, he knew a bass player. Yeah, he knew a bass player. So we got a hold of him and he said he was definitely interested. And then the bass player said, I know somebody who would be great for singing in this. So we got a hold of her. And then she joined the band. So now we had six people in the band. Whoa. Yeah. So I'm doing lead vocals and Tim's on guitar. I was also playing guitar. And uh, we had Chris on drums and uh, 
Alec was playing keyboards and uh, Patty was the sing singer. And uh, we were doing good. We were, we were, you know, we, we were actually getting paid for our jobs, you okay. know, doing really well. We were getting paid for a change. And we were, you know, <laughs> Where because we're doing we we're we're doing we're getting a lot busier. We're still playing some dive bars, but we're, okay. we're gigging really good. And um Chris eventually was started to lose interest because it wasn't this kind of music anyway. So um uh, he bowed out and we got another guy to fill his position and we fired him, and then we got another guy and we fired him, and then we got another guy. Fire him. We fired him. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had uh, another. We had, we had uh, oh, the bass player. Yeah, the bass player. We fired him because we his bass didn't sound like a bass. But so we fired him, and we got this other guy come in, and he was it's okay. <laughs> it was okay. So and then we got this other drummer, and uh, he was fantastic. And we hung on to him. Then we got another bass player, and he was fantastic. And then we got another leader singer. Uh, we got a, another female singer, and she was, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, uh, the keyboard player that we originally had, Alec, he eventually left. And then we got another keyboard player, and he was he's good. He was good. So we uh, eventually the lineup changed several times over the twenty years that we were together. And, that's a uh, long time to be in it. It's a long and, time and to be in a band. Like damn, that. twenty years we did that. And that's call. longer than most bands are together. I I know. And Holy the, cow. Uh, we played a lot of, I know, dude, man, we played some great places. We got paid stupid money for what we did. Um, God, man, they, we got, I got, we got hired by a casino in Indiana. They called us up and said, can you guys come out here and play? I was like, oh, oh shit. Sure. We're not going to say no. Oh, no. You know, how much you, oh, well, how much are we making on this? And the guy threw a number at me and I was like, what, what time are you almost there? You want to there tomorrow? <laughs> right. Uh, and what's great about gigs like that, and the more we, the, the longer we played, it got to a point where we were, we could like call our shots. We could say, okay. you know, we could name our number. And it's awesome. Uh, and eventually we got, we got agents to handle our booking for us because I was doing it all and it was just too much because I had a full time gig at the time. I was working full time. I couldn't do it. You know, I couldn't do the booking and the blah. You know, I was already managing the website, Facebook page, and all that other crap like that. Plus, plus, doing the podcast. So I had a lot on my plate, and so I finally got the. We got agents, and they were booking at us some really good places. These are uh, when it, when it comes when you think about gigs, it's like A rooms, B rooms, and C rooms. Now you okay. C rooms. <laughs> I like to I like to say the C to Z rooms are your bars. <laughs> Okay. You want to be as high in the alphabet as you can be. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, if you're playing, you know, you're doing the C and the D rooms, you're okay. But when you start getting into the M's and the O's and the P's and the Q's, you know, you might want to start thinking about your venues a little bit harder, you know? And, um, we got, uh, we were playing uh, a lot of A and B rooms and they, I mean, they took care of us. My God, you would not believe the food spread that they would have backstage for us. Oh my God. You think, we, think we were Kings or something. Um, I, of all the places that treated us well, I'd have to say, mm, Oh my God, that's a tough call. BB Kings in New York city treated us really good. Um, there was more food backstage than I knew that I could eat, you know? And, uh, there's a casino up in upstate New York. I can't remember the name of it now, but it's right. It's like two miles from the Canadian border, but okay. now, all these places would put us up. They would get in hotel rooms. Damn. Yeah. Hotels, transportation back and forth to the venue, uh, food. We didn't have to end and they paid us. <laughs> That's living the dream. It was, it was good. You know, I had to take a lot. I lost a lot of time off from work. You know, I would be, I was using my vacation time for a lot of this stuff. All of us were working. For, well, it was like Tim and I were still full-time employees. Um, our bass player, he owned his own tire store. So he, he could take off whenever he wanted. <laughs> um, the, the three other people in the band, they were full-time musicians. That was, that's what they did for a living. So we just had to like schedule. So it, it was just difficult for me and Tim because we had to schedule our gigs all around. Um, Your work. Yeah. Yeah, work and stuff like that. Oh, Penn's Peak in in Pennsylvania. You know Penn's Peak? No. 
Oh my God. It's a great concert venue. It's in the, it's in the Pocahontas by, uh, by uh, Jim Thorpe. You know, Jim Thorpe is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's right by there. It's called Penn speak. Big names play there. You know, we're talking tour, national touring acts play there. And we got thrown on a bill with a, um, a Bob Seger tribute band. And so right. they decide, well, we're, we're going to, you're going to open for them. I'm like, okay, fine. How long we get to play there? I hear, I'm thinking they're going to tell us you got 30 minutes, do your thing and get off the stage. But they said, Hey, eh, you play for an hour. I'm like, Oh crap. Great. So, uh, the, well, I don't know if it was the largest crowd we've ever played for, but it was one of the biggest. There was, there was over 1800 people. Wow. It was, it was standing room only. And we finished playing and we, we ran off the stage. Uh, we, you know, we, we broke down over, we didn't have any road people. So we broke down our own crap. <laughs> we get up the stage and, uh, rich, the lead singer uh, for the senior troop band, because he goes, now we're supposed to follow you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, ah, sorry, dude, <laughs> you know, but yeah, it was, it was like, it, it, tell you what, but you know, at once the, once 2020 came around, uh, you know, the whole pandemic thing happened. Oh, yeah. And we were at the time we were really, ha we were going to have probably one of the best years we had because we were, I had the books for well, pretty, put it this way by the first of the year, I already had us booked through uh, July. Okay. And this is including using the agents. I had us booked through July and we like to do, one to two gigs a month. And that's only because, you know, time, taking time off sure. of work. These other guys have other bands that they're in. So it was, and when you think about the kind of money that we were making, you know, one to two gigs a month, it was like, great, you know, that's fine. You know? Yeah. And uh, then uh, we were, I was on the verge of having probably, we were, we were looking at, so yeah, at eight, probably about 24, 25 gigs for the year. So that's, that's like, a lot. So like, and that was like, okay, that's like, you know, two a month yeah, at least, which is good. Yeah. But, uh, we had our first job. Our first show was in, in January and we were expecting a, a sold out theater of 500. And when we got to the theater, there was 40 people in the seats. Oh, because at this time the whole pandemic thing was ramping up. Yeah. And nobody wanted to be out in public. So oh. within three weeks, all of our other gigs canceled. And, uh, you know, we tried to, I tried to keep it going. So, you know, finally I just said, dudes, I'm out. I'm yeah. done. You know, 20 years, I'm done. That's finished. And Tim said, you're done. I'm done. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was it. And, I, and we, we closed it out. And then, uh, Tim and I moved down here to North Carolina. <laughs> so, nice. You know, but uh, yeah, I, well, you I, can I, always you can always blame the breaking up of the band on the pandemic. That's it. it I wasn't Yoko Ono. It wasn't you know was you it. didn't stab no. each other. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's like, ah, you know oddly it. enough, you know, because um, the uh, the original drummer, like uh, the drummer that we had that we really liked, he quit. He 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 resigned from the band. Uh, at the end of 2020, uh, at the end of 2019, he resigned from the band because I'm doing too many gigs with my other band and we're not, you know, we're not playing enough right now. So I'm going to go, I'm going to stay with them. Okay. Fine. All right. So we got another drummer to fill his shoes and not nearly as good as the other guy, but, <laughs> but uh, they, they tried to keep it going. They actually, they're actually trying to keep the band going. They really people, uh, the bass player, uh, the, the drummer now, and the keyboard player, the only three, actually the bass player is the only original member of the band now. And these other two guys, uh, the keyboard player and uh, the drummer, of course, and they, they replaced it with some other people who were leftovers from these, these other bands. And the bass player even said, yeah, we're not, not, not as you're good, but we're not as good as we used to be. So he's going to fire them now. He's going to continue. <laughs> uh, it. No, no, he's, he's, believe it, he said to me, he's like fed up. He's done with it. He's tired of it, you know, because they've, uh, they've, Sent now, mind you, this is three years now, and they've only had one gig in three years. Oh, so, like they don't even rehearse anymore. So it's like he's he's pretty much done with it. But they, hey, they couldn't recover after you guys. Yeah, I crushed them. And, crushed you them know, the Tim and I have talked about, you know, let's get another band going. What do you want to do? And it's like you know we're both retired now, so we got all the freaking time in the world. You know? Yeah. And, um. 
we just don't know what we want to do. I said, you know, we could always just do another Melon Camp thing. <laughs> you know? well, why not? Right. If it no, works, either, you know, classic we, music. Yeah, we can. We probably do. That. I don't know. So we're, we're still tossing it around. We don't know. What we're doing there, but, That's awesome. Uh, so throughout all that, we still, we, I still rode my motorcycle a lot. You know, That's awesome. So both your brothers ride. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, what was, now were you the one that got them into that? Or had they had uh, an I interest? Know, I know, or your brother had the scooter, right? Well, yeah, Tim had the scooter and he used that mostly for back and forth to work. Okay. And um, Chris, well, actually, you know, prior to Tim getting the scooter, I guess I was, I guess I was the inspiration for them to want to get to Chris because I know Chris always wanted to get his motorcycle license, but he just didn't, he didn't know how. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. He didn't know how to do it. So I explained what you got to do and all that. And, you know, so what Tim did, he would, he would, uh, they both went and took the test, you know, the written test, of course they passed. And then they went, uh, and they would borrow a friend of Tim's had a bunch of scooters and he would loan Tim the scooter and he would go out with them. And then uh, he, Chris would go with them every now and then. And then I would come up with my, I had the sports at the time. I would come up with the sports and we'd go on rides well, you know, they, the, the, those two guys on scooters and me and my sportster and we'd be cruising That's around. That's always a fun combo. I've been there. It's a fun combo, scooters and a pie, you know, and a sportster. So and what, what's not the like, right? <laughs> so uh, we'd be riding around Warren County in the hills. Let me tell you something. Scooters don't like hills. Nope. Wow. So, but uh, eventually uh, uh, they, uh, Chris, uh, t- Tim moved up first. He went and got a, he got a Yamaha, uh, a V-Star 650. Okay. It was a really nice bike. Really, yeah. really nice bike. It looked good. Uh, it was super comfortable. He liked it. And he said his only complaint was that uh, on the highways, he said this thing was screaming. It just couldn't go any faster. You know, um, he had that for a few years. And then uh, what uh, Chris didn't have a bike. And one day I was out, um, I was at home. And I was actually, I was out on a bicycle ride and I saw this motorcycle on the side of the road and the guy wanted 2,400 bucks for it. And it was a, it turned out to be a Yamaha, um, help me here. Yamaha. So oh, what was it? Oh, uh, Virago. It was okay. Virago. That's so, the bagger yeah. one, isn't it? What's that? Is that the bagger? I'm trying to think. No, I know the name. No, I can't no, place no. it. Uh, it's kind of like if I had to put it in a category, it would fall in a category with the sportster. Okay. But this guy had it raked out, man. He had, he chopped it a little bit and had it all raked out. So I, uh, I saw, I, I was talking to the guy for a while about it. And then I finally, I called up, I called up my, my brother, I called up Tim and I told him about it. And then I called my mother and I told her about it. And then he goes, she goes, well, how much does this guy want for her? And he goes, about 2,400 bucks. And he said, okay. So my mother actually just doled out the money nice for that and they said okay well he's got the money now so well, somehow she got the money to him so i went over to the guy's house he lived like uh this guy he lived about literally driving distance maybe a mile from where i lived okay so, uh i went over and i picked the bike up and i drove it home and then i had to get it up to chris because we were going to surprise him with it for his birthday which was in september so the day i wrote now I had never ridden a bike like this before. It was a chopper. It was, you know, I never yeah. rode a bike like that before. And because, you know, choppers are kind of squirrely in the corners. <laughs> so, I, uh, I said, I'm going to ride the bike up. And I'm going to ride it to my brother Tim's house. Halfway up, and I don't know what it is with me, but halfway up, it starts downpouring. Oh. So here I am on this chopper on the Garden State Parkway, and it's downpouring on me, man. So... But I eventually got to Tim's house oh. soaking wet. And I just took Tim gave me a pair of sweatpants to wear because I was drenched to the bone. <laughs> and um, I guess when so Chris came over later, and we made some stupid story like we need your help doing something. And then he came to smoke, swung the bike on him. So he was pretty happy. He rode the crap out of that bike, man. He That's rode awesome. The crap out of it. And he dumped it twice. <laughs> um the second time after he got it dumped, uh, uh, just a lot of scratches and stuff, but he wanted to get it worked on because it was, excuse me, 
there was something wrong with it. He he couldn't he didn't know what it was. And my brother Chris has uh minimal mechanical aptitude. So he found this shop over by where he lives. And he brought the bike over to the guy and he said, can you just fix it and take it, do what you got to do with it? And he goes, yeah, fine. And my brother just happened to notice that he had, this guy had a, another Virago in the shop, but it was in pieces, you know, on the side. <laughs> so, oh boy. So the guy has, so he goes, okay, fine. I'll, I'll work on the bike and I'll, and I'll get it back. In. So uh, I guess about a month and a half went by and he never called my brother at all. So, he never returned his calls either so eventually chris went over there and his bike was in pieces and the other virago was gone oh shit so he said i want one i want the bike back he goes well i'm not done fixing it he goes well you've had the bike for a month and a half what's i so he gave chris back the bike in pieces and there were parts missing and so he still couldn't ride it but you know the bike was in pieces so eventually what ended up happening was, well, I sold some property I had, I sold some property. And so I had some spare cash and Chris just happened to, as you know, Justin on a podcast, he works up at uh, Bergen. He, mm-hmm. at the time, he worked at Bergen Harley Davidson. So, uh, you know, he, we were up there visiting Justin and uh, there was a, a 2002 fat boy on the floor and Chris fell in love with it, you know, and the price was price was right. So, I said, dude, I said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the money for the down payment. If you make the payments, I'll make, I'll give you the money for the down payment, but on one condition, what's that? I said, you give me the Virago. You got to sign the Virago over to me and I'll give you to 3,500 bucks. He goes, okay, fine. So he signed it right over to me right away. And uh, the, the Virago sat in my driveway for about four months. And I did some work on it. I put some pieces back on it, put it back together a little bit, but there was something going on with the transmission and the bottom half that I couldn't figure out. So I, I eventually sold it. Okay. I, think, I think I ended up selling it for 1800 bucks, something like that. I sold it real cheap, but yeah, that's what Chris, so Chris has still got his 2002 fat boy. Tim eventually moved up to a 2002, uh, electric glide fully loaded. I saw that. It's a nice bike. Yeah. It's a big, it was a big bike too. And Tim wasn't comfortable with it yet. So, I went with him the day he bought it, the way he's the day he was supposed to pick it up. I went with him. He bought it from a private seller, and uh, I, he, I he had me ride the bike back from the guy's house in Pennsylvania back to his house. So for the first few weeks, Tim just basically just rode it around town just to get used to the bike. That thing was, it was just. I, I know electric glides are big, you know the, the the ultras. I know they're big, you know, but for some reason this bike just seemed really big you know? <laughs> and tim's not a tall guy you know tim's like five six five seven or something like that so he dropped it a lot he dropped the bike a lot you know there was a dip in the road underneath where he had to put his feet down bikes going over you know so yeah it's a, it's amazing how big that bike is because yeah we went from an intruder 1500 to that and it felt like we were driving a station wagon it, it seems such a big bike you know, and the thing is, I wanted one of those back in the day. Yeah, I would go to the uh, International Motorcycle Show in New York City, mm-hmm. and I, I miss that. That was such a great time. Dude, you know, the IMS show. You know, like we said, IMS. We would get the IMS show, <laughs> as you know the joke. If you say IMS show, you're basically saying <laughs> International Motorcycle Show show. So, <laughs> but I would. Lo- I loved going to that show. Mm-hmm. That was great. I had a great time every time I went. But. But I would, every time I went, I would, I would uh, you know, prior to getting the bike that I have now, I would sit on the electric lot going, like, I like this bike. This is nice. This is nice. And then I'm like, eventually just got the, this is really big. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but the, I like the heritage. Yeah. The heritage is a great bike. You know? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, and it's all kind of, like you said, it's it, the, the problem with a big bike is it's always a big bike. And the problem with a small bike is it's always a small bike. There's no, <laughs> you know, there's no, I mean, yeah, you can take the tour pack off, but it's still not a small bike. Yeah, you know the thing is something about the soft tails. Uh, they're—I don't want to say they're mid-range bikes. They're really not. They're—they're they're, my my bike is like seven hundred pounds, so it's not a lightweight by any mm-hmm. stretch of imagination. The the advantage that the soft tails have over the the uh, bigger touring bikes is the um, they're a, a bit lighter uh, and they have a lower seat height. Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, when I'm, I'm dealing with a, a 24 inch C height, not bad. It's like 24 and a half inches, you know, and you, you think about it. That's, I mean, it's super low. It's really a low, but it's comfortable as hell. Super, super comfortable, you know, and that, that's one of the things that I really like about the bike a lot. So it's a, it's a nice bike. It's cause it's sort of the, uh, to me, that's the classic Harley look to it. Yeah. That, you know, and it's a shame. Like for example, the, uh, the Harley Deluxe, which they discontinued, mm -hmm. sucks. I think holds more of the more classic look of the Harleys that we know from back in the day, you know. But uh, yeah, that's just, it's just something about the uh, the soft tail line is just the bikes are so smooth, first of all, and they uh, they they feel they're comfortable as hell, you know. Like I said, lightweight, low seat height, you can't beat them. They're just great. No, they're you, fantastic. Yeah, you're riding what? You got the you got a 2020 uh yeah i just drew a blank 2020 rogue light limited yeah see I had, I had the ultra i had i've only had this one for a year and a half and i had an ultra for about three years wow yeah see the road glides are cool there's something about the road glides are just really cool i don't know what it is i think it's the, I don't know. the problem with the road glide is that when i wanted one it was pre-rushmore so let's say it was like 2012 and then right. they discontinued it for a year. Then they came back with it after Rushmore. And then all of a sudden it became cool. And I wanted one before it was cool because I liked the fact that nobody liked it. It was the ugly stuff. Everyone's like, that bike's ugly. It's not a classic Harley. I'm like, but it's cool. It's the anti-Harley. Yeah, you know what it is? It's just in the, the earlier road glides had that real, that real shark nose on it, right? You know, and that's what I think that's what everybody hated about. But then when they brought it back, all of a sudden nobody hated it anymore. Yeah, I'm and curious I, I, to see what the new one, how the CVO is going to shake. And not the CVO, but the CVO style is going to obviously come down to the, the standard line. I'd like to, I'm curious to see how that's going to shake out. I don't know. You know, it's like I've, I've only ridden a road glide twice and that was both a test ride. Okay. And, um, I was amazed at how nimble it felt. I thought because of the, the fairing being frame mounted, I thought it was going to be a, a beast to handle. And it wasn't. It was no. really light. It was really easy to handle. Um, I don't know. It's just, uh, you know, and the second time I rode one, I I was too busy trying to figure out how to operate the freaking radio on the thing. <laughs> to really notice what the hell I was, you know, I was like, the bike is great. How do I turn this radio on? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like I couldn't get it. You know? When I took one, the first time I ever rode one, I took it out for a test ride at the, um, oh, it's the dealer by AC. I always screw up the name, but they, um, the guy's like, well, I'm not going out. So just take it out. Well, the GPS was pointing. I didn't know how the GPS works. The GPS is pointing like north, but I'm going south. I don't know. I couldn't figure out how to get back to the dealership. And I'm <laughs> like, I'm going to be the guy that calls like, hello, I'm at a Wawa. <laughs> Come pick me up. <laughs> Wow. But yeah, there's 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 just too many damn buttons on that thing. When you first get it, you're like, what the hell's all this doing? Well, dude, you know, I, I had the chance to ride the Pan America the first like the first oh. four months that it was out. I had a chance to ride one. I went up to Bergen Harley and Justin was working there and he gave me the ins and outs of how to, you know, function on the bike. And one of the things that struck me right away, even for, as I was driving out of the parking lot is how many freaking buttons there were on the grips. Yeah. Right, right? There were so many buttons. I'm like, what does this do? Truth, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I must have beeped the horn like 30 times just trying to put the freaking signal on. <laughs> because of it, this proximity to the turn signal, and it was right there. It was, beep. I kept blowing the horn all the time. But... <laughs> The, the, uh, the test ride was horrible because it's up in North Jersey and I was stuck in a traffic jam. So I really couldn't say I got a great test ride out of it. But yeah, it sucks too. It's like Barbara's great like, that. Though. it's still you great. You take in the spin and you're like, all right, we're sitting in traffic. Like, this isn't really. Yeah, I know. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, no, but uh, I don't know. But yeah, you're right, man. With the handlebars with all that crap on them and just <sighs> mine's real simple. I got turn signals and on off. And I'm good. That's yeah. I mean, that's, that's the one thing I miss about the intruder. Sometimes it's just nice. There was nothing, you know, it's one of those things. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> then all of a sudden you're like, it's uh yeah, there's, there's a lot. Going. So what, what got you guys into the podcast game? Cause that's, that's big. I mean, that's a well, huge, you've been around for a long time. So it's not like you just jumped on the COVID bandwagon. No, no. What it was is um, 
one of the things I do, I don't know, you can't, well, obviously you can't see me behind me, but I have uh, my bicycle is set up on an indoor bike trainer inside. Okay. And it, back in Jersey on days where it was inclement weather, it was cold out or snowing, whatever the case may be, I'd have the bike on the trainer in the office. And while I was riding, I would listen to podcasts. Okay. And this is, uh, you know, 2014 going into 2015. I was looking, listening to podcasts. It was back then it was the pace podcast. And of course, motorcycles and misfits and uh, Cleveland moto. And those are the three main ones. Okay. Uh, the wheel nerds, they were, they were, I think they were still, they were around at that time. Uh, adventure rider radio. So I would listen to these guys and, uh, adventure rider radio is pretty much all about adventure riding and which was basically in its infancy back then. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the wheel nerds were uh, very fun and I'm sorry that they went away because they, 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 their podcast was fun. I enjoyed listening to those guys. Uh, now I, I like Cleveland moto. I like motorcycles and misfits. Um, and of course the, I enjoyed the pace as well. And one theme that I always got from them was they, they put off this vibe that they were. And, and, and again, this is the, this is my, uh, my perception of what I was getting, what I was okay. hearing. They, they were, they were not cruiser or Harley friendly. They did. They, they didn't like them. And I heard a lot of bashing, you know, and I'm like, you know, look, you know, okay, fine. I get it. You don't like it. That's cool. That's fine. But I, I would hear that a lot. So finally I just said, you know what? Well, how about if I start my own podcast and we talk nothing but Harleys and cruising and piss everybody well, else off. It's them. No, it's them. You know, so, <sighs> so, um, I, I, I actually, I dove in head first and I got some books and I learned how to do it and I learned what I needed to do and learned what I needed to create the podcast. And I got all this stuff and I said, probably against my better judgment, I asked my brothers if they wanted to be involved. Because <laughs> that's a good idea. Because it's always a good idea to get your stupid brothers involved. Why not? <laughs> and I had this weird vision in my head of how it was going to go. And I never imagined in a million years that I would have been the straight man. So and 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 as it turns out, uh, our first few episodes were kind of bland, you know, and we were just it's just a lot of crazy talking. Uh, the first actually the first two episodes, it was just me and Tim because Chris couldn't make it because he was working. But eventually that and then about the third week, Chris came in and that's when any formatting or anything else just went to hell. It's just it, forget it, because now I had these two knuckleheads and. <laughs> It's one of them, I can't remember who it was, whatever it was, Tim or if it was Chris. One of them found this app on their phone. Uh, they found this app for sound effects. And Tim plugged it in, and he plugged it into his phone, and he plugged that into the, the mixer. And it would come through crystal, crystal clear. <laughs> and it was like, and we were, and at the time, we did the podcast live up in Tim's studio and in his house. And we just, okay, this is crazy. This is, this is a lot of fun. We were having a blast at that time. Now, now we're, now we're having a great time. We're having a lot of fun. And, um, uh, Chris put the app on his phone. I had it. On, I didn't have time to do it because I was too busy trying to run a show and these two guys, and, and it made it a lot of fun. It really did. And I, th then we started having guests come on the show to be a part of the madness. God, we even interviewed our mom. We had our I, mom. yes. Yeah, we had our mom on the show and we had her. So it was that we had friends come on the show. We had all kinds of people come to the show. I even had I've I've had I had Phil from um Cleveland Moto on the show. And that was in 2016. I had him on the show and it was election night in 2016. Oh and so he was on the show, and I was really surprised that he would do the show on election night of all nights. Um I've had Liza on the show a couple of times from uh, motorcycles and misfits. Um, the guys at pace at that point, they pretty much pulled the plug on their podcast and they stopped doing it. Okay. And, um, the, we, I was on the wheel nerd show. I never had them together on the show, but, um, you know, I've had other podcasters come on the show and, but it's, it's interesting though, in, in the eight years that I've been doing this podcast, uh, I did a tally about about two years ago, and at the time I counted, there were 164 motorcycle-related podcasts. 164. Now, of those 164, I think there were only maybe a dozen 
still in operation. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know how many there is now. I have not, I have not looked, but I would say more than likely that number is less than 20 active uh, motorcycle related podcasts. You, well, well, you were saying about YouTube, it, it comes and goes. It's funny. You can see somebody that's on fire and then just one day they're gone. Yeah. You know what it is? I think, I think it has, you know, life gets in the way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. Life gets in the way. Um, I've been asked how long I'm going to do this. And uh, my only answer that I can give is uh, probably up to lunchtime, the day of my funeral. Okay. So, yeah, you know, so I, I enjoy it. We eventually added, uh, I decided to, you know, uh, give the uh, podcast a little kick in the pants. And then we invited Justin to be a full-time member of the podcast. And he was like all over it. He said, yeah, sure. So uh, it's uh, it's been fun. It's been fun having all four of us. We started, you know, we, we, we do giveaways a couple times a year. Uh, the biggest event, um, which I'm sure you know about, is the... Uh, the annual fat ass Santa Christmas giveaway. Yeah. And uh, thankfully I have some wonderful, wonderful sponsors and guests who've been on show who uh, are more than happy to uh, contribute to the giveaway. Tobacco motorwear always gives away something, usually a pair of jeans, uh, uh, wild ass seats. Now they're, they're a great sponsor. They give help. They give away stuff too. They provide stuff for us to give away. Um, uh, scorpion helmets, uh, Chris Martinez over at scorpion is very eager to uh, like hand me a helmet to give away. Oh, that's awesome. You know, all the time. So, uh, and you know, it's like some, some of the authors have put up their books to give away. So it's been, everybody's been really wonderful when it comes to, uh, participating in, uh, our, our giveaway on the show. And it, I, I tell you why it really, at times I start thinking, man, I the podcast isn't working anymore. It's just, I don't know what it is. I don't know what else I can do. And then something like that happens, you know, well, you know, the, the giveaway happens and you see how many people get involved and who really, you know, want to contribute to that. And then you go, yeah, okay. So it's doing good. You know, it amazes me in this community, how many companies are so, I mean, I don't know, you think of Apple, right. Or any of these major corporations, you sure. know, you, they've kind of lost touch with it. They're, it's not any brand, right? The bigger you get, you kind of feel like you're just a number. You got a lot of these motorcycle brands where you could talk to the owner, you know, and it's, it's just amazing to me, the support that they give their own community. Oh, it's They're great. You no, know, um, I had the opportunity to speak with, uh, Ansel Adam and he is the guy who runs, uh, mm -hmm. oil. I saw that when you were Sturgis. Yeah. Yeah. And he, um, he's more than happy to do whatever, man, to be on the show and talk. And they're super helpful. I'm like, damn, this is great. You know, I met uh, up at Sturgis. I met so many people that just absolutely wonder you, right. The community is just really tight and you know, we're, we're all here for each other. It's great. Um, I don't know, man. It's, it's, I mean, you couldn't ask for anything better really. That's awesome. And especially too, I mean, you've got, you've got bigger name, well, big name sponsors, but you've, you've got people that support it. And I think that's great. Cause then you have the yeah. ability to give back the way they gave to you, which I think exactly. is really you know, great. And, you know, Dave over at uh, Dave Ackerman at uh, Tobacco Motor Wear, uh, Craig Johnson at Wild Ass Seats and you know, Chris, Chris Martin is over at uh, Scorpion Helmets. Uh, they know that I'm talking about them every single time I do a show. They know mm -hmm. Uh, they know that on my YouTube channel that I'm talking about them, you know, I, I, their, their logos are there all the time. Uh, I did some helmet reviews for Scorpion helmets. You know, again, those helmets that I reviewed, those reviews, they weren't asked for. They weren't saying, Hey, can you do review this home? They weren't reviewed. I just did them. And then, yeah. and then one day Chris Martin sends me an email and says, Hey, I want to send you a helmet. I want you to give you a review. I'm like, Oh Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't need a helmet. But he sent me the helmet. I did the review, and then I said, "I don't need a helmet. Can I, you want me to give? Can I give it away?" He goes, "Yeah, give it away." So I gave it away. You know, um, Zero Three D sent me a bag <laughs> and so, to review the bag and give it away. I'm like, okay. I uh, think that I, I'm glad to see that Harley's doing that. But I love when you see the motorcycle brands do that, where they're actually giving it to people in the community. That you know, it's a genuine thing. It's not like a. Yeah. You know, they're not paying some actor to do it. I think there's, no, I there's a lot more to it. Yeah. And, um, I would, I honestly wish not just not for me, this is, you know, not for me or maybe for the podcast, but I wish more companies would do that. 
Mm -hmm. I wish more companies would email me and say, Hey, uh, can we get you to do a review of this product and you know, give it away on your show? I'll do it in a heartbeat. I'll do it in a heartbeat. And for no other selfish reason is that it, it might bring listeners to my show. That's sure. it. You know, I, I'm, I'm not looking for free stuff. If you want to give me free stuff, I'll take it. But <laughs> you, you can't know? turn down the free stuff. <laughs> you can't turn down free stuff. My mother always <laughs> says, never turn down free food or money. So, oh. you know, so, or motorcycle parts. Okay. You know, or motorcycle parts. I, and she, of course, I, 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 I equate that with food and or money. So I just, it goes right. Okay. In. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, I'd like, I wish more companies would do that. Just, you know, come on, send me an email. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll talk about your product. I will do a review of it and I will give it away. Well, yeah. And you've, you've reviewed, um, you've reviewed a bunch of companies. I know Let's Roll was on recently. I mean, you've, yep. you've... Yes. I've had, oh my God, I've had uh, 170, you were 175, I believe. I've had 176 guests on the show. Wow. To date since the show first started. Um, more, I've had more guests in the past two years, I think, than I've had any other time. But, uh, um, at one point I was doing, if you go, if I go back to the catalog, I was having like three interviews, four interviews a month. No, more than that. Wow. Sometimes two or three a week. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know what it is? And it's like, and it's people go, well, you got to space those out. I'm like, no, why? I did it. I'm putting it up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no sense in dragging it out. I'll get another interview. So, but you know, it's, it, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm running out of people to interview. There's plenty of people out there to interview. Um, it's hard to get a hold of people. Yeah. It's hard to get a hold of people to interview. It's like, come on, you know, I, I emailed you three times already. What's, what's the problem? So, hey, you know, they, they all could, they all eventually come around. Exactly. So, but now what I always thought was interesting with your podcast is you have the ability to sort of pivot between the, the sound bites and the, the craziness of your brothers and then to go into interviews. I mean, you, I mean, for God's sake, you interviewed Charlie Borman. I mean, that's a, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's well, not to take away from any other guests, but that's, you know, we had talked about that. That's a big, yeah. You, you know, know, um, big name. It was, it was, it was I, I tried for like, I don't know, I guess like three months nonstop trying to get him on the show. Cause he had just put out a book. Uh, it just, it was called long way back. It's when he, mm -hmm. he, had a, he had a bad motorcycle accident and broke both of his legs. And it was just about maybe his re leading up to the accident, his recovery and what he went through. So um, when they finally agreed, when he finally agreed to be on the show, I was like, Oh, this is great. You know, I can't wait for this to happen and stuff. But he, to answer your, to get back to your original question was, um, I, I used to have guests on the show with, with all of us. Mm -hmm. on the show. I used to have them on that way. And it, it just, I just, it was, while it was okay, I, I wanted it to be more than okay. I wanted it to be great. So mm -hmm. the only way for me to do that would be to separate the two parts of the show. So when we went to a bi-weekly format, I used that week in between to do my interviews. So that enabled me to devote more time to, uh, to the guest. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things I focus on when I'm doing my interviews is it's not about me. So I do as I try to do as little talking as possible and let the guest do all of the talking because nobody wants to hear from me and you hear from me all the time. So you don't want to hear me. You want to hear the guest. So when I think of my questions to ask the, uh, the guest, I have it. I don't want to say I have it scripted out, but I have it written out as anybody does mm -hmm. what you're going to ask the guest. And I like for those questions to be sort of like a trigger for them to say, to go, you know, just mm -hmm. talk your face off. Well, you know, you were on the show. So, but I like, um, and of course, as anybody knows, who's ever done an interview, that doesn't mean that just because you have a plan that nope. it's going to go that way. <laughs> I have had, interviews that were absolutely spectacular and went on for a long time. I, the longest interview I've ever done was almost two hours and 15 minutes. That's a long interview, That's a long interview. And you know what? The time flew by, man. It was great. That was, uh, when I spoke with, uh, Tim James from, um, that country's discoveries. Okay. And that was a great interview. And one of the shortest interviews that I ever did was, uh, 18 minutes. 
Oof. Now, 18, when I say 18 minutes, that includes the sound bites opening the show and the sound bite closing the show and my little tidbits in between that I do to promote the sponsors. So all total, that interview was probably oh, 11, 12 minutes long, maybe. Oh. Jeez. And it's like, if I wasn't talking, there wasn't an interview. So, <laughs> well, and that's, that's the part that I think that, that yeah. people don't understand. It's like, sometimes you just get in that, you get caught, not cornered, but sometimes it just isn't going and you're like, all right, this was really good. <laughs> I've had a, I've had a couple of people in that would talk and they'd be like, so anyway, and then and it would just stop and you're like, but go keep going. But. <laughs> Come yeah, back, come back, come back. My, I can't. My, me, my problem is I don't shut up. You know, but yeah, nothing wrong with that. When it comes, when it comes to the interviews, I shut up. Yeah, because that's it's awesome. Not my time to shine. You know, um, I have, I've reached out to ever since Sturgis. I've let's see, I've had uh, three people on from Sturgis already, but I've got like four or five more on the hook. Nice. And, uh, and then a couple haven't responded yet. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I don't know. It's just, it's just, I don't know. I guess everybody's so busy that they don't want to respond or they can't respond or mm -hmm. they see who it's from and they go, I am not talking to that guy. <laughs> so I have no idea. <laughs> the social media thing's weird because I, I've had engagements with companies I was trying to do reviews for and you, you, you feel like you're stalking them. And then they're like, oh, yeah, you sent that email six months ago. We saw it. But, yeah, we, we got, got busy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, and that correct, and I, I, that, it, it kind of infuriates me in that I know you got the email. Mm -hmm. you, you know, been delivered. You know it's been received. If you're too busy to talk to me, all you have to say, look, uh, we're going to be very busy at the moment. Uh, if I'm interested, I'll get back to you. That's yeah. all I need to, then I won't bother you again, but that's not the way it goes. And I, I give, I give potential guests three chances to respond or do the show. That's fair. And it's, and that's fair. It's more than fair. And I have had on more than one occasion, several actually, where the guest blew me off. I'm oh. sitting, I'm sitting at my computer ready to do the interview and they don't show up. Oh, so I'm like, you know, type in an email later. Uh, where were you? I was waiting for you. Oh man, I forgot. I'm so sorry. Okay. How about that? Okay, fine. We'll set up another date. Same thing. Set up another date. Same thing. You're done. That's it. Yeah. No it's... more, no soup for you. That's it. You're yeah. out. That's, <laughs> you know, so, Hey, look, I mean, I, what? It's, it's hard, right? Because the timing is so. Yeah. You know, because there's only so many days in a week mm -hmm. and I, outside the podcast, I do have a personal life and I do got shit to do. <laughs> Bottom line. Well, so, too, and I, I think, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. No, it's all right. I think sometimes too, it kind of throws off the excitement of it. You know, it's, it's kind of like, I mean, I can only see it from my side, but it's, it's like when you're, you're. I don't know. You're working on, you want to work with a company to do a review or something and they're all excited and then they blow you off and blow you off. And by the time it actually happens, you're like, all right, well, yeah, <laughs> you kind of lost the enthusiasm at that point. Right. You know, <laughs> that's why I don't, I don't promote uh, my interviews. I don't say, I might mention it on the podcast with the guys. I might say, okay, I got an interview coming up with this person, this person, this person. Uh, but I don't promote it any more than that. Because mm -hmm. I never know it's going to happen. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't bother. <laughs> so, uh, but I have, um, I do have interviews that I have been trying. There are some interviews that I will say, honestly, in all honesty, people that I want to have on the show that I don't give up on trying for. And right now I have two specifically three okay. that I've been trying for over a year. Oh my God, probably two years to have on the show and wow. I won't give up. I keep sending that email out, putting the bug in the ear. Hey, 
I'm, if I would like to have you on the show, if you're interested, here's, here's our format. Here's the way it goes. You can check out. We've been around for a while. So it, we're not some, you know, fly by night podcast that started and we're in the basement of mom's house and, you know, me and the kids sitting around, you know, it's not like that. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a few I just haven't given up on yet. I hope they uh I hope they happen soon. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I was I was gonna ask who the who that would be, but I don't wanna I don't, I don't wanna ruin that. Say because I'm a no, I wouldn't. No, I get that. And, uh, I can tell you who may not be on the podcast. That's Karen Davidson. She's probably not gonna be on the show. <laughs> evil can evil. <laughs> evil can evil. Yeah, evil. you're not gonna make a show. We don't care. You know the Karen Davidson story? No. You don't know the Karen Davidson story. Okay. So are we gonna talk about Sturgis at all? Oh, I got, I got some, I got plenty for you. I mean, if you got time, let's roll because I'm enjoying the hell out of this. Okay. We talk whatever you want. I got, I got I some know, critter I, questions I, to sneak I, in I, there too. We can skip ahead. I and can I'll do whatever you. you want. I'm having fun. I'll tell you a little, a little Karen Davidson story. Well, this is a little, this is part of Sturgis. So, uh, up at Sturgis at the Big Engine Bar, they were having their uh, biker bells thing, right? So I knew some people were going to be there that I wanted to talk to. I, okay. I knew. I knew they were going to be there. So I said, let me get there when they finish their ride. And cause I know they're going to be gathering in a big engine bar and they're going to have this whole thing and I can be there and I can corner them. Well, not really corner them. I don't want to sound creepy, but I can, but you are. <laughs> I knew I, I am. I, I know where they are. So I get there and I, I did manage to, well, so I'm there, I'm standing in the back and I see uh, Jess from her two wheels. Uh, mm-hmm. you, She's there. I, I wanted to talk to her. She, I had her on the show once before, yep. but I've never met her. So I wanted to meet her in person. I saw um, uh, Stacy from Ride to Food. Mm-hmm. Stacy? Yeah, Stacy, right? Yeah. Right? I know the channel. I don't, I'm yeah, terrible Stacey. with the actual names. Yeah, it's Stacy from uh, Ride to Food. She, I saw her there. I wanted, I wanted to talk to her. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Lori Struck was there. That's uh, Gloria Struck's daughter. Mm-hmm. So to say hi to her because I've, I've i've spoken with her before um so th- they were there and there were some other people too i wanted to talk to but so the festivities but while we're there i see sitting at the table with jess and and stacy i see this woman she's got a ha- hat on she's got long blonde hair and she's signing books so the first thing that comes to my head an author you're in have her on the show great you know you know it's a motorcycle it's got to be a motorcycle book right so the festivities die now and I, I pop over and i talk to jess for a few minutes you know and then i talked to stacy for a few minutes and then i got up and i went over and i said hello to Lori struck talk to her and then i see the woman with the long blonde hair and hat talking to this other woman so i politely walk over and i just said excuse me <laughs> and i said i said hi uh, my name is Ted. I'm with the Motorcycle Men Podcast. I saw you over there signing books, and I thought I would like to have you on the show to talk about your books. And she gave me the dirtiest look. <laughs> the look that I got from her was, die now. How dare you even talk to me? You know, that's the look that was on her face. And she goes, and I didn't have any business cards, so... That being tacky as I can be, I hand her a sticker that has the website on it. And I said, this is all I got right now. I, I'll I, please email me and let's call me. Let, let's get in touch. And I'd like to have you on the show and to talk about the book. I had no idea who she was. I really <laughs> didn't know. So I was like, um, and I was like, okay, cool. Uh, great. And she's like, thank you. And she's like, she's like stormed off. I was like, okay, well, I, I was, I couldn't be any politer. I really was. So uh, I, I, <laughs> I walked in the back of the room and I was, I saw something like, I'm like, yeah, I was like talking to this and talking to her. And I saw that woman with the blonde. He goes, you know who that was? I'm like, I have no idea who that was. He goes, that was Karen Davidson. And I'm like, like Harley Davidson. He goes, yeah, that's Willie G's daughter. I'm like, Oh Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, um, I oh, don't know funny. that Karen Davidson is going to be on the podcast anytime soon, but if you're listening, uh, please, <laughs> <laughs> call me <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah. then there's the other part of me and, and not to throw shame but there's the other part of me that like you're just a person you know what i mean like yeah, we've all done it you start talking to somebody that, and you're like you know, oh that was so and so you know you know and the funny thing is is after i got back to to, to north carolina for after sturgis i went onto the uh the website and i i found her 
on the Twitter page or somewhere. I can't remember where I found her, but I emailed her again to remind her <laughs> who I was, as if I'm not a glutton for punishment enough. But I emailed her again and just I have not heard back, of course. But that's funny. Yeah. So I mean, it is what it is, right? <laughs> I mean, what are you gonna do? You didn't know who she was. I didn't know who she was. You know, what can I say? I tried. I tried. But hey, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. You know, sometimes you gotta take a shot. You know, it's, it's doesn't always doesn't always turn out. Yeah, you know, I've um I've had I've had a couple guests on the show that agreed to be on the podcast, you know, be, to do the interview. And then while they're on the interview, they sounded like they didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can, I can, I can gather that information very quickly, you know, mm -hmm. based on their responses, how they respond and how long their responses. If I'm getting short responses, I know right then and there that that person does not want to be on a show. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do my very best to make it as comfortable as possible and end it as quickly as possible. <laughs> Let's just get this over with. You know, but, you know, it's like, yeah, exactly. Because I'm talking to him and going like, and I'm thinking in my head, oh, my God, this person really doesn't want to be on the show. How much time do I got? Okay. Oh, God. I've only been going for 22 minutes. Okay. I got to drag this out another eight. You know, <laughs> so. it's like a bad first date. You're like, oh, yeah. I'm getting the hell out of this one. Yeah. So, but, um, yeah, you know, if I, like I said, I've only had really one bad interview and that was only because it was it was just a hard difficult one to do but most of the other interviews i have I mean, everybody's very eager to talk and i'm i'm very eager to let them talk you know because the more they say the less i have to talk and the less it sounds like an idiot you know so that's fair that's but fair. you you what, what's the tagline you say stupid shit so people don't I have say to stupid, yeah we say stupid shit so you know well actually we say stupid crap so you don't have to <laughs> and uh Trust me, we, we say a lot of stupid crap. <laughs> oh, you guys are hysterical. I was listening to you guys this morning. Uh, I was doing some work and I was like, let's oh, sure. crack it up. Which episode were you listening to? It was the uh, Jeopardy episode with, um, oh, I'm terrible with names. It's one of the more recent ones. I want to say it was done. Now you can make me look. <laughs> I can tell you. Hang on. Let's, I mean, you know, I can show you. I'm not, I'm not making shit up. Hold on. No, no, that's not, it's quite all right. That's quite. We've had, we've had a lot of fun guests on. Um, it was episode 430. I'm oh, sorry, 340. See right there. Awesome. Okay, which one? Who's who? Who's Ax, Axel's on. Who? Ax. Oh, Ax. Yeah, he was great. He was great. Um, I, I can honestly say that 99.9% uh, .9 of the people who have joined us for um, the the Jeopardy thing have been a great. Have been great. That's um, it's it's, it's a cool idea too. Uh, yeah, because you know, it, um, geez, I had. Um, who was it? Oh, it was Rich from uh, Loud Pipes podcast, which isn't around on, anymore, unfortunately. But he was on the show, and I I thought he wasn't having a good time, but uh, I emailed him. No, he, he he. I emailed him next. Oh, are you okay, man? Did he seem like you're having? He goes, dude, I was cracking up. I don't know why, I couldn't. He couldn't handle it. He was. He said he was just having such a great freaking time. So. I try to, uh, you know, some people have, I've actually gotten email complaints that people thought that the Jeopardy thing was stupid, that we shouldn't be doing it. Oh, that means you should do it more. So they're watching. My, they're listening. Uh, my response to that was to very say, if, if you listened to any, any of the Jeopardy questions that I'm asking, they're all related to things that you can address on a motorcycle places to go mm -hmm. roads to ride on the things to visit uh information about more that's all things like that it's all things you can go visit roadside america is one of the uh, our popular topics well there's roadside america attractions all over this country and in canada so mm -hmm. when i bring these things up these are things that a rider can say hmm maybe i should go check that out it's nearby where i live you know, that type, that's what that, that that's what the idea behind the Jeopardy things, not just getting uh, the other guys involved more into the show, but also it, it's it's I think it's fun for the guest. And it's also fun for the audience to try to figure out that crap themselves, you know. Sure. Because um, one of the things I know, the reason why I started doing the Jeopardy thing is because uh, as of the you know, 2020, 
the pandemic happened, obviously. So we, we were doing remote stuff. And in the beginning, well, we weren't, we weren't prepared for that. We just, yeah. we were not prepared to do a remote show. None of us were. I mean, I, sh- I shouldn't say that. I was because I had the gear to do it. But Tim and Chris, certainly not Justin. Uh, Justin just got a laptop a couple of years ago. So <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the new world. Justin. Yeah. Well, welcome to the 20th century. So, um, so in the first couple of times we did it, it was horrible. I'm like, man, I mean, we're going to lose so many listeners because of this, <laughs> but eventually, you know, it got better. It got better. But the one consistent thing that I saw with doing the remote podcast, you know, and then of course, you know, Tim and I moved down to North Carolina. And we haven't done a live show where we're all sitting in the same room since, oh, like uh, maybe October of 2021. That was the last time we did a live show where all of us in the same room. And uh, we've been doing it remote ever since. And one of the things that I noticed that when doing a remote podcast, and then, you know, we're all doing, we use Google Meet. We don't use uh, StreamYard. We don't use Zoom. I tried Zoom, but it's my God, that's a big ticket item. Mm-hmm. It's another monthly feed I just don't need. Yep. Um, so I just, we went to start using Google Meet and uh, it's got its pluses and its minuses. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I noticed that is when we're doing the podcast, we're remote, I see these other three guys and they're just staring at the screen. And it dawned on me. It's like these guys are watching TV and they're waiting for something to happen. Yeah. You know, so I said, you know what? I got to get these guys more interactive. I got to get them involved with the show more because they're zoning out. And <laughs> I can't have them zoning out. So I started doing the, the Jeopardy thing and it, it's, it's brought a new life to the podcast. You know, ever since the the, the sound effects went away, you know, of course, you know, like what? You know, as friends. <laughs> you know, that went away, you know, that tugboat, of course. That, yeah, the, the tugboat's great when it's like pulsating. And you're no, like, exactly. you know, <laughs> so uh, the sound effects, the sound effects went away and it's like the show felt for us, the show felt dull. It's yeah. Like, you know, I know a lot of the listeners would, co- I would get emails, dude. Oh my God. I would get so many emails. I've even gotten phone calls. <laughs> Will you please knock it off with the sound effects? It's driving me freaking nuts. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not going to stop. That, that's more reason for me to keep it going because it's driving you crazy. But look, you keep coming back. Yep. You know, and you know what? You got to admit, look, I had, I don't know if you, I don't, I have the sound effect. I don't have it posted yet. I don't have it on my stream deck, but it's, it's, it's the, it's the sound effect where it's like, it's like a jeopardy thing was uh, dun, 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 dun. And if you remember that sound effect, I had somebody call me up uh, and they said to me, you know, I, I'm cursing you because every time I'm, head. Truck or I'm doing something, I hear that dun, 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 dun. I was like, well, you are quite welcome. I'm glad we could provide song implant complete, you know? So, oh, that's great. You know, so, I mean, the sound effects are going to make a return. I've had, I've had other podcasters call me or email me. I said, dude, do you really have to go with the sound effects? I'm like, yes, I absolutely have to go with the sound. Effect. It's part of our show. It's exactly. what we do. It's our show. That's, this is, look, you know, it, 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 it it's got to be fun for us. So that's why we, that's why we do it, you know? And, um, I started, I mean, I'm giving, I'm giving a giveaway, a, a little trade secret here oh. that, uh, we don't actually do a show inside a cafe. Look, I don't want to talk about it. You, you, <laughs> finding that out was like finding out Santa Claus wasn't real. I mean, I'm not going to lie, damn it. And I'm going to feel stupid saying this. When I first heard that I was Googling it. Cause I'm in Jersey. I'm like, I wonder where they are. I'd like to go see that. And then it suddenly starts dawning on me. I'm like, those fuckers aren't in a cafe, are they? <laughs> because yeah, the, the fact oh. that you have the, the subtlety of the diner behind you, that it really does sound that way. And I'm like, oh my you know, God. And the funny thing is, it's like the first, I have to go back and check when I first started using the sound. Because I found the sound. There was this website uh, that I used to listen to. 
um, because it was like, I used to listen to it at work because they have thousands and thousands of different types of uh, sounds. It's like, it's like, it's like sound therapy. Okay. And it helps you focus and concentrate and stuff like that. And one of the sounds that I liked was like a Canyon sound effect. It was of, uh, it was like a you know, native American flutes going and it was awesome, but I was scrolling through the sounds and I saw, I saw this cafe restaurant. I was like, well, let me hear this. And I'm like, Oh shit. I know what we're doing, you know? And it does all, I, I brought I, I, at the next oh. podcast. I queued this sucker up and I said, welcome to the V twin cafe. And Holy crap. It, it worked. It worked. I was like, God damn it. It's staying, <laughs> you know? And, I, and, and, and the funny thing was this went on like this. And I, to this day, we still use it. We still yeah. use it. And to the, and so I guess maybe about six or eight months later, uh, I get, I get, a, I get a call from um from rich from the loud pipes podcast and he goes i have a question for you i was like, he goes, what's up what's that he goes how do you get such clear freaking audio recording your podcast in a freaking diner i'm like what he goes oh, you're in a diner you're sure. how does your audio sound so damn good what are you, are you using noise gates or filter how are you, what are you doing I, I, i'm like dude that's not real that's just a sound effect in the background He's like, God damn it. <laughs> it's so well done though, because you don't, you don't really, you notice it. You don't at the same time, which you know, makes I, it hysterical. I, I can hear it now. There are tens of thousands of people out there right now going, Oh, I, I get I, on average, you know, on average, I get probably one or two emails a month. Asking me where the V Twin Cafe is. Oh my god, it doesn't exist, man. It says we're looking in Cranford, we're looking in Shalot. We we don't find it anywhere. Where is it? Oh god, it's nowhere. It doesn't exist. So I'm thinking that sometime soon, I better like open up a freaking restaurant that's called the V Twin Cafe before I freaking lose it. Right? I, I think you should. <laughs> I just I thought it was so well done because, like I said, I really did. I was like, wait, no, maybe it's not. No. Maybe it is. I don't know. And then I'm like Googling away and I'm like, wait a minute. They got yeah. me. Um, I really honestly, seriously was looking to, for a rental space in Cranford back in Jersey. I was looking for a rental space. Um, even if it was just a single room, you know, just like my office, I'm in, right now, even if it was just a small room in an office building that I could rent, you know, and just use it twice a month and call it the V twin cafe. I would put a freaking sign out in front of the door that said V Twin Cafe. I would set up a Keurig in one corner, and people could come in and get coffee, and they can listen to the show. I was, I was seriously, but I could not find a space that was less than a thousand bucks a month, man. Oh, I bet. So, yeah, I, so I, I couldn't fund that, and because there there are no podcast dollars, you know, unfortunately, yeah. I hate to break everybody's heart that you know there there is no money in podcasting unless if your name is joe rogan but that's it you know. yeah joe's got it joe's got it on lock though yeah you know he you know i think uh well youtube shut him down i think he's not he can't do his thing. Oh, oh yeah he does he's just clipped somebody shut him down for a while he wasn't able to do uh i don't know some some sort of political crap he wasn't able to do his show. oh yeah well that's he's yeah. not another outlet and he's he's back out there again i know yeah. he's on spotify uh of course uh, well, who isn't on Spotify actually? Right. Yeah. I mean, as, as far as it goes for where my show is, I was surprised to find out how many outlets there are for listening to the show. Mm -hmm. I thought there was only like three, but any place that has podcasts that broadcast, forget it. We're there. Yeah. Any place. And I was, I was really happy. And the thing is, what's sad is I only get reporting uh, and that's the bad thing about podcasting. You just don't know what your real numbers are. You mm -hmm. just don't know you're, you're not going to get numbers from every single source out there. And there are dozens of sources for listening to uh, podcasts. There just are. And you just don't know what, what, what numbers you're getting from any mm -hmm. of them. You, you're only getting numbers from the source that you are uh, subscribed to. For example, I use Buzzsprout. Mm-hmm. 
And I only get numbers from them. I don't get numbers from Google. I don't get numbers from uh, Apple or Spotify or nothing. I don't get any numbers from those guys. So I can only guess at what our numbers are. Do I care? Yeah, yeah it would be nice to know, but eh, that's not my driving force. I don't care. That's fair. Yeah. Just got to put it out in the world. So there, now here's the question I've been dying to ask you. And okay. I'm going to, I'm going to splice this out because if my wife hears this, I'm going to go yeah. broke. How did you get started into rehabbing animals? Cause that honest to God, that's gotta be the most interesting <laughs> thing that it, it really is because uh, I'll be honest. There's a part of me in my heart that wants a raccoon. And I know that Katie wants one for Christmas. Well, not gonna happen. I, it's going to have a dream. <laughs> okay. So it was 2000, 2002. It was a dark day. It was, it was a dark day and the clouds were rolling in. Um, and my <laughs> wife found a baby squirrel in the backyard. So uh, she brought it in. She, she wrapped it up and, to keep it warm. And she, she didn't know what to do. So she looked up uh, wildlife rehabilitators. And she found one that was literally less than three miles from where we lived. So she contacted her and we became friends with these people. And the next thing I know, we're rehabilitating squirrels. You know, we got, we got baby squirrels in the house. And then uh, it eventually moved up to uh, basically, would you like to try a raccoon? Sure. And my wife goes, a squirrel. Sure. Yeah. It's like more than merrier. Bring it on. So uh, we got two. And this was like, again, this was an early, this is probably 2003 at this point. Uh, we got two baby raccoons. I mean, I say baby, I mean, like they're smaller than your hand and you mm -hmm. have to bottle feed them. Oh. And uh, you have to, there's a whole thing. Now, wild life rehabilitators, uh, let me start by saying this. They get a bum rap. They get virtually no support from state, local and federal governments. Zero support. However, they get a tremendous amount of grief yeah. from those said entities. Uh, the states will uh, really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They will, they'll beat you down okay. in every chance they have because they don't want you to rehabilitate animals. They really don't want that. They have a thing against that. They would rather issue a hunting license than they would see an animal survive. Now, that's not now before without getting too political. I'm, I'm totally second amendment. I, I totally agree with that. And I totally understand the whole thing about uh, conservation of wildlife. There has mm -hmm. to be that conservation. Otherwise you get overpopulation. And then, then thing, then you have real problems, mm -hmm. not just within animals over running into human, human areas, but you also have the health and disease of wildlife going crazy in the muck. So, I, I totally get that. However, uh, states, like I said, state, federal, and local governments, they give zero support or help to wildlife rehabilitators. So many wildlife rehabilitators are electing to not report the wildlife that they get because you're supposed to report wildlife that they have to the state so the state can come and inspect, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay. Well, a, a, lot of, a lot of rehabbers not just in New Jersey, everywhere, they're starting to not do that because they, they don't want the ridicule. Oh, okay. They, the, the, the states would rather uh, misinform the public than inform the public. And the, the number of people who don't know that there exists such a thing as wildlife rehabilitators is shocking. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a service that's available pretty much in every state. And if you find wildlife, just you call one of these people and they'll, they'll take it from you, depending on what it is, they'll rehabilitate it. When I say rehabilitate it, nurse it back to health or raise it to adulthood. And then they set it free prior to them being set free. Everyone should know this. They are inoculated all wildlife that re wildlife rehabilitators get. They are inoculated before they are set back in the wild. that inoculated for distemper. They are inoculated for rabies. So no animal that is set free from a wildlife rehabilitator has any disease. That's something that everybody should know. I did not know that. Yes. And the other thing everybody should know is that there are more feral, uh, rabid wild dogs and cats in mm -hmm. this world than there are 
uh, raccoons. In fact, groundhogs are more rabid than raccoons are. Really? Yes. And to <laughs> also to, to 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 cut short any any other thoughts, uh, possum are do not uh, exist. Do not have rabies. That that's they they just really. Don't. No, possum because because of all the animals, and I know they get a bum rap. That's what I would have thought would have nope, rabies. They don't. In fact, possum will eat thousands and thousands of ticks in your backyard. Thousands. They're, they're very good for the environment. The, huh. Possums can withstand uh, coral snake and rattlesnake bites and survive. So we are learning a lot tonight. <laughs> we are. They're very resilient. So, but anyway, getting back to the original question. So, what ended up happening was, why am I getting boings on my computer on my phone here? Oh, that's all right. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, we got to, after the squirrel, we got uh, we got a couple more squirrels, and then eventually we we graduated up to two raccoons. Uh, our second year, or I guess it was our second or second year, we had two raccoons. And when you get a raccoon in March, you have that raccoon until September. You know, okay. Eighteen weeks usually, and they go from being little teeny wee to be things you have to feed with a bottle. Then they uh, then they advance to the terrible twos. Which way I got to go? Which good? At that, that point, they're very, very curious and they're very fun. They're very active and they're brats. And then they get up to adolescent age, which is usually right around two, three months. Yeah, about three months. And then they're funny as hell. You know, raccoons are hilarious. They are very funny. Very, raccoons can open up a complex lock within 10 tries. Wow. They're very, very smart. Um, in fact, there was a movie out not too long ago called uh, raccoon nation. Look it up. Raccoon nation. Okay. Um, raccoons. W w humanity is making raccoons smarter because of the things we do. Raccoons learn to counter the things that we do like locks on doors, locks on garbage cans, whatever they okay. figure it out. They, they figure out how to open. They figure this shit out. And they, they, and they've learned how to survive despite of us. Now, there's a lot of encroaching of humanity into wildlife sure. areas, and as a result, they have to, they have to adapt. Mm -hmm. The only thing that is is that humanity hasn't adapted. No. We still view them as their wildlife, and they're coming to our area. Well, it's kind of the other way around. <laughs> you came into their area, so you have to adapt. You know, I had a, I had a, I'll have to show you the video. I had a raccoon come up to our giant bay window the other night. Not the other night. It was a couple of weeks ago. And he's staring at my cats and my cats are staring at him. And he's just hanging out. Had nowhere what? to be. Just hanging out. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, there's a lot next to ours. And it's it's a vacant lot. It's, you know, it's a lot of big property around here where we are. And we have uh, up to nine raccoons. A fox, a possum, and a couple families of deer come by our house every night. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. So it's like, okay, <laughs> it's no big deal. But the, the, the raccoon thing, it's a, a, the rehabilitating thing. It's, it's every year we average between uh, usually up, up to four squirrels. We get uh, once in a while, we'll get skunk once in a while. We'll get, um, well, bunnies. We usually hand off to somebody else because bunnies are very difficult, but uh, and then we average between five and seven raccoons a year. That's awesome. That's what we raise and we release. And where we release the raccoons, uh, if you go by state laws, they tell you you have to release it where you found it, which okay. is stupid. Yeah, yeah, that is stupid. And like the, he's going to remember where he lived. Well, because their argument is because if you don't release it where you found it, he'll never find food. Well, that's kind of stupid. Raccoons are omnivores. They'll eat anything. They'll eat anywhere. They don't care. It's like if I took you out into the middle of desert, desert, or if I blindfolded you, put you in a car, and drove you out in the middle of nowhere, dropped you off, and said, "Okay, you're on your own," I think you could find a meal. Yeah, I think you could. <laughs> right. So, it's 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 it, to say you you can't. So where we take the raccoons to release them, it's way out of the way. There's nobody around, and they have plenty of access to water plenty of trees and so they're all good you know we release them and we never see them again that's got to be an awesome feeling though once in a while one of them will come back not really not, not back home to where we live they'll come back to the release site okay 
we'll see them and they'll stick around, you know, they'll stick as, or they'll, they'll take up residence, you know, in a tree somewhere close by. But, um, yeah, this like, we never see them again. That's it. They're gone. And that's amazing though. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not, it's a lot of work. Uh, when you have baby raccoons, you're going, you're feeding them four to five times a day wow. and then you're bottle feeding them at first. And then when you're not, usually when they get to about eight or nine weeks, maybe 10 weeks, yeah, no, I'll take that back. Maybe about eight weeks, they're off the bottle and now they're onto solid food. And now you're preparing meals for them twice a day. And, you know, raccoons don't eat with napkins and forks. They're messy. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't completely rehabbed them okay and uh, i have this saying and a lot of people have adopted this saying and, and the saying is if you have a real raccoon you own nothing <laughs> you don't you, they take it it's theirs forget it you'll never see it and if you do see it again it's not going to be in the condition you it left it's i'm telling you i they'll they'll take your shit <laughs> that's funny and they're a lot they're a lot of fun they are tremendously a lot of fun uh when they get, when, it comes to a certain point where they go from the little little cage in the bedroom to the to a bigger cage in the baby room. We have a room in the house dedicated for babies. And mind, keep in mind, when they're adults and released, they're still babies. Okay. So they they go to the baby room, and that's when they're usually about eight weeks, nine weeks old. And then when they're full fully grown, they go to the outside cage, which is an eight by eight cage. Uh, two levels. So <clears throat> they're out there. And usually uh, once a week or maybe twice a week, depending, mostly once a week, they get daddy playtime. And that's when daddy, <laughs> that's when daddy climbs in the cage with them. And, and then I become their new toy. You know? <laughs> it's like, you know what it is? Everybody says, well, you shouldn't do that because that's bad for them. No, you know what this is, is nurturing. Yeah. You're teaching them that they have to learn because their mommy, your their mommy usually does this kind of stuff, teaches them how to hunt, teaches them how to climb, teaches them how to figure things out. So, when we do that, when I get in that cage with them, I'm helping them figure things out, how to climb, how to, what is this? You know, uh, they use their hands a lot because they have more uh, nerves and sensory uh, nodes in their hands than they do the, and then the human does in their whole body. So they basically see with their hands. That's basically what they do when they touch and everything. They have soft pads on their hands. Uh they also there's the also misconception that they they wash their food before they eat it. Mm -hmm. They they have very small salivary glands, so it's hard for them to swallow. So they make in their food wet so they can swallow it. That's what that is. Interesting. Because my kids were talking about that the other day. Yeah, that's what they know. And the other thing is to, to dispel all the misinformation that's going around that the that the local and federal and state governments like to tell everyone is that if you see a raccoon out in the day, it's probably got rabies. That is not true. What that is, what that means is that's probably a mommy out looking for food because it has babies to feed. So now when you see a raccoon out in a day, if, if it's walking in circles, foaming at the mouth, yes, it's probably got rabies, but more than likely you're not going to see that. But if you see a raccoon out during the day, it's kind of like you waking up at three o'clock in the morning and going I'm hungry. I'm going to go get something to eat. And that's what they're doing. You're going to the, they're going to the fridge, but their fridge is outside. So <laughs> they're going to Wawa. And they're, they're going, they're going to Wawa. They're going to the dumpster behind your house, whatever the case may be. But that's that, you know, so <laughs> raccoons are, uh, you know, wildlife in general, they're here for us to enjoy. Um, not necessarily to eat, but they're here for us to enjoy and to, to share the planet with, you know, they're, um, I, I enjoy wildlife. I enjoy seeing them. They're, they're, they're entertaining. They're, I think they're, I think wildlife is funny because they don't understand a lot of things. So they respond to whatever they see in a very curious manner. So mm -hmm. it's entertaining, you know, I have a wildlife camera outside my house and it's just hilarious to see what I see every day. It's just, <laughs> yeah. so that's the story of the wildlife rehabilitation thing. That is awesome. I mean, that's, yeah. And because a lot of credit. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is uh this has been a pleasure. So as we wrap this up, I guess the question is, and you are the guest, so it is in your hands, sir. How would you like to leave it? How can people find you? Well, okay, we're on, like I said, any platform that you can listen to a podcast, we're there. Just look for the motorcycle men podcast. It's just motorcycle men, and that's a, you'll you'll see us there. And we put out an episode 
I would like to say weekly, but it's actually very weekly, but um, more than likely it's going to be every two weeks, but there are usually interviews in between. Um, I just posted another one this week. Yes, I did. So will there be, there's, we're going to have a live show next week. Nice. Uh, wait a minute. Are you on next week? Tuesday. Tuesday. You're on, you're going to play Jeopardy. Yeah. I'm playing Jeopardy just so, you're, yeah, I'm going to You're going to play Jeopardy with us on Tuesday. <laughs> now, the thing is, now, see, you got to kick their asses. That's the, we, 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 we encourage the guest to kick their asses. And I'm not giving you the answers to any of the questions. Well, when you start asking about the values of motorcycles, I'm screwed. I was listening uh, today. I'm like, I'm fun. So That's fun because everybody hates that category because nobody has no freaking clue. So that's great, you know. <laughs> and it, what's interesting is, well, it's Jeopardy. You, you, know, you could just Google everything and look it on a phone. You can get the answer right there. Well, yeah, you can. But where is the fun in that? Exactly. The, what we rely completely on everybody's honesty to just go ahead and just look at the answers available on the screen and pick one. That's it. That's a lot of fun. So anyway, so yeah. So we, uh, any, any place you listen to podcasts, we're, we're there. Um, I am also on YouTube. Look for the ride with. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, bring it up. We can talk about it. Yeah. So, so you're also, Hey, uh, Ted, I had a final thought there. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was trying to let you talk. No, <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. So when did you get into the YouTube game? So we're going to uh, we'll backtrack well, for a second. Well, yeah, we'll backtrack a little bit. Okay. So a, f a couple years ago when the bike uh, went down, the, the camp chain tension is on the heritage went and I couldn't afford to just bring it to Harley and have them fix it. I couldn't bring mm -hmm. it. And I had to learn how to do it myself. And so over the course of six months, I bought all the tools, bought all the stuff I needed, blah, blah, blah. And I documented the entire thing. And I said, let me put it up on YouTube. And I was really an amateur at it. I didn't know what I was doing. I learned as I went along is what I did. And okay. I just posted them up and I posted them under the motorcycle man moniker, I, I assume well, this is, uh, we'll just be part of the podcast. And I, I posted them that way. Eventually I just said, you know what? I, I, I want to separate the two. I, I, I want them to be two separate entities because what I do on YouTube has nothing to do with the podcast. Sure. Although I make it, I do make it part of the podcast. But anyway, so I, I decided to uh, just start calling it ride with Ted because it's just me riding, you know, and doing whatever. And that's that. So I, I, and this was, I don't know, three, four years ago, five, well, I say wait, 2019. Oh my God. So it's been, yeah, it's been almost five years now that I've been doing that. And I've nice. only got <laughs> pathetically, I've only got 79, 77 episodes out uh, on my podcast. Cause uh, on my um, YouTube channel, um, it's in, 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 and I have to be honest, it's like in the last year probably in the last year i've been more more determined with it okay to make it because i've been devoting more time to it uh i got more i got another camera i i got better stuff although you couldn't tell that by my youtube channel because my microphones keep breaking um that's yeah that it, it really pisses me off you know you spend all this money on gear uh, especially the, with the, the GoPros and the freaking audio goes out I'm like what mm -hmm. the hell. So you, you go buy the freaking module and then three months later it breaks again. It's like, God damn. So, or you buy a different type of mic and then the mic cable goes. And that's one of the issues that I have constantly. It's that and batteries dying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a never ending battle to make sure everything's working fine, but when it's working, it's working, you know? <laughs> so, um, I, I thought, uh, yeah, so let me just keep pushing it. And, uh, before I went to Sturgis, I only had 273 subscribers and I'm not like, I don't I look, I don't, I don't look at the analytics. I don't look at any mm -hmm. of that. I'm like, hey, look, if you want to watch it, watch it fine. If you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. I don't care, whatever. Um, but mm, on, after I got back from Sturgis, started publishing the Sturgis videos, I, I picked up. 200 subscribers in about a week nice yeah and it kind of like plateaued a little bit but uh it one of the things that i found which i would I, maybe i shouldn't have looked into this but i discovered that 97 percent of the people who watch my channel are not subscribed and i'm yeah. like hold it 97 percent of the people out there who are watching my channel are not subscribed 
how hard is it to hit that subscribe button? I mean, go on. Yeah. so I was like, all right, Hey, whatever. I'm just going to keep going. So I'm, I pick up a subscriber every now and then, you know, it's, it's slowly growing. Um, I like most of my Sturgis videos are up. Uh, I got like five more to publish. Yeah. I mean, so, Sturgis is a good topic for growth though. Cause I feel like you could put anything up with the, the name Sturgis in it. And it's going to at least draw the interest to see what it's about, which is yeah. good. Yeah. You know what it is? I think, I think people though are tired of seeing Sturgis party videos. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, I mean, and my videos aren't like that because I am not a really a party guy. Mm -hmm. but mine's mostly about this is the environment you're going to encounter at Sturgis. Here's what you can see while you're at Sturgis. And here's the things that are to do around Sturgis. And here's the ride you can do around Sturgis, that kind of a thing. But uh, the weather was so crappy. Yeah. That I really didn't get a lot of riding in, you know, I was kind of disappointed in that way. And, uh, again, I went by myself and I was kind of overwhelmed, but I did my best, you know, and I, I went out there with this goofy idea that I was going <laughs> to, I was going to do a video a day and I was going to publish a video. a day. <laughs> that's like after the first night I was like, yeah, it ain't happening. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so here I am like, you know what, uh, six weeks later. And I'm, I'm still publishing uh, Sturgis videos. <laughs> yeah, but I uh, see, I don't know. I, I don't, I think to me, I know a lot of people do that. They'll publish the same night and go out on the road and take a laptop. But to me, that's not what you're there for. You know, yeah. to, you know, I, I had my laptop with me and I had all, all the gear I needed to, to actually, I could have published a video a night, but you know, when you're out riding all day, doing whatever all day and you get back, to your accommodations and then you realize you, you've got okay well i've got like six hours of video now i got to edit it down to you know half hour mm -hmm. or less and i know that if i do this at home it takes me a couple of days so i realized it was unrealistic to even think about that but uh i i, I like I, I like doing the uh the videos i think it's all it's a lot of fun uh i enjoy the editing part of it that's the mm -hmm. heart as you know that's the hardest part of doing it, but I actually enjoy it. It's actually a lot of fun to, to, to build this from the ground up. You know, you can, you see what's happening at the end, mm -hmm. you know, and well, we'll see what happens, you know, as uh, I've got some great ideas for upcoming videos and we'll see how it goes. Awesome. We'll put the link in there for the podcast, we'll put the link in your YouTube channel. That's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. But, so we, so, so are we ready yet or can we? Yeah, I think we're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so Ted, I meant to ask you, so how would you like to wrap this up? As the guest? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm Ted. I'm the host of the most like a man podcast and, uh, also on the ride with Ted YouTube channel. You're on YouTube. <laughs> just like you don't want to get into that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can find the podcast on any, uh, platform that supports, uh, podcasts and you know where you can see the YouTube channel stuff. It's on YouTube. So, and, uh, that's it. Oh, Come, thank you very uh, much. Subscribe to my channel and, uh, and listen to the podcast. Yeah. You guys, you guys absolutely owe it to yourself to do both. Yeah. And so, definitely fantastic. listen next week because Brian's going to be on the show. He's oh, going to see how well he does in jeopardy. Yeah. That's the other three knuckleheads I have on the show. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Ted. I had a great time sitting and talking to you not only tonight, but the other night. So that was good. All right. So it's great. Been a huge fan of the podcast. So well, thank you. Appreciate well, thank it. you so much, sir. And uh, for all you guys, we uh, hoping to bring this back weekly, but uh, please check out and subscribe to the channel and uh, make sure you check out the motorcycle men podcast, as well as Ted's personal channel. That's as cool. always guys, please stay safe. and Remember you're not alone. Thanks so much for watching guys. You got it.